Howdy everybody in YouTube land. This was something I was not planning on doing a video about, but as I dug into this thing, I decided that it is important to cover this subject. Um, and anybody that works with vintage hardware knows of what's going on here. And, um, and it's for the norm at this point. So what you're looking at is an HP Omnibook 425, I think, which is, yeah, right here, 425. So I began to take it apart and I dug into it and I decided to pick up the camera. But, uh, so there's two things happening here. One is something that's going to happen to all laptops and you can probably see it just barely. You see that right there? There's that gouge, which is not a gouge, and there's some bubbles developing. And what that actually is, what what that actually is, is um, the polarizing film. On an LCD panel, there are two pieces of film. There's one in the front and one in the back, and they're typically out of phase with one another. So, uh, for example, the back might be zero degrees, and the front might be 90 degrees polarization. Or you can have a 45 or a 135, or it just, it all depends. But in this case, um, since this is what we call a reflective LCD, there's a piece of film in the back that kicks the light back, just like a calculator or a Game Boy or something along those lines. So that means the two polarizing films are in phase. So the back polarizer could be zero degrees, 45, 90, or 135. The front is going to be the same. So that means all light gets reflected through until the liquid crystal turns on and bends and then it'll black out the pixel because it'll change the polarization of the light. That's how an LCD works. I'm not going to get into any more theory with that because you can go find that in other videos and Wikipedia and stuff like that. But what I do want to cover is the blemishes that's happening here. So I've done a lot of research on this and what I've, what I've come to find out is that the film is made of a PVA material or polyvinyl acetate, which is the same material that's used on those 1960s color roundies. So when you see the cataracts on those CRTs that are done in other videos from Shango 066 and others, that's the PVA material that has degraded. Well, LCD panels use the same material. So the material, this is getting old enough that the material is starting to degrade. This will happen on every single LCD panel, whether you like it or not. Heat and humidity accelerates it, but this has been stored in my climate-controlled environment, and it's already happening. Granted, this thing is 20-some-odd uh, years old now, so almost 20, let's see, 93 to 03 to 2013 to 2023, almost 30 years old. So this laptop is almost 30 years old. It's two, two years away from 30 years old, so it's time for these LCDs to start doing that. And it's, 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 a, it's, a, um, it's, it's a phenomenon known as vinegar syndrome, which comes from the film industry. Because again, like this film, regular film suffers the same fate on some of them. Now, what I can't tell you is if some of these LCDs used a plastic film or if they used a PVA film. Not all of them are the same. And then what's being sold online right now is I can get the film for this. I can get all different types of film, including reflective and transflective film. Transflective is reflective, but it also allows backlight to come through. But this one's not a transflective display. This is a reflective display, non-backlit. So anyways, uh, you can still get the film, but it says in the description that the film is PVA made and it's good for up to 20 years. So it's the same exact material. So even when you replace this, it's going to do it again. So until someone comes up with a solution that's just regular plastic, this is going to keep happening. But now that it's 30 years old, it's starting to happen. And all I checked all my other laptops. It's not happening yet with the exception of a 540C. But this one, it is happening. And this is the best one, my most favorite one in my collection. So this is... This is part of it. So later on in the video, or maybe a second part in the video, we'll go through replacing the film on this. And I'm going to probably do both sides um, because this opposite side on the back is going to do it too. But we won't know for sure until I dig into it. Anyways, so that is the first part of this. 
So, you know, would that be video worthy? worthy? Yeah, maybe. But you know we can't have a video without having some other issues. <laughs> so we're getting to that. Uh, let me get this out of the way first, though. Actually, before I get too carried away, the bat, there's a little bit of this battery acid left in there. So I got to clean all that out, too. So the second part to this, and then you can probably see it all land back there. Uh, to get this machine apart is not easy. Um, it's a royal pain in the ass. And the way it works is, on the bottom of this, I don't want to flip it up without losing parts, but on the bottom of this, there are several screws that come through and mount it to the top plate through these little posts. And also the hinges are connected here and here. Uh, I already had the misfortune of breaking a resistor off trying to get that air, and there's, there's the other end of it, but I'll fix that later. Um, because, you know, yeah. But that's not it. It's hung up in the front. So the other thing you have to do is on the back side where the PCM CIA cards go, you have to get one tool in here to, to pry up on the case a little bit to get some force against it. And you got to get a flat blade screwdriver between this plastic piece and this keyboard assembly here. You got to pry that outward while you're prying this one upward. And then what'll happen is it will pop out of the groove and then you'll get it apart. But these little PCM CIA door flappers that go here will pop out on you. And so will the springs. So watch those springs so they don't come flying across the room because that would be a really, really bad idea. Um, the other thing to note here is I got the motherboard out and that brings me to the second part of this video. You can pretty much probably tell where this is going. So here is the motherboard. You can probably see what I'm getting ready to talk about. This is the motherboard. I had to go in and clean up all the connections. The battery acid has eaten off the solder mask, so I had to scrape away all the solder mask. Same thing over here. And what happened here was the capacitors. Guess what? You know we can't have a video with a vintage computer without these guys causing a problem. So there's some green corrosion. Let's see, figure out which ones they are. Yeah, it's, there it is. Let's see if I can get it to focus in the camera. See the green corrosion there? There's some liquid stuff oozing out of the pins. And obviously onto the board, which is why the solder mask is eaten away. So these two pins, I just cut them out of the circuit. So, yeah, these two, you can kind of see it wet on the positive pin on that one. This one same ordeal you can see it wet right in there on the negative pin so they were on its way out and what prompted me to work on this is I, I don't know about eight years ago i had this computer plugged in and it worked fine and i put it away right when i brought it out today when i noticed the vinegar syndrome developing i'm like you know i'm just going to plug it in and play with it didn't turn on wouldn't turn on i saw it drawing current from the power supply and to keep in mind that the center pin is negative on these HPs. That's not positive, it's negative. So it drawed current, but it would not post. It would, the screen would not turn on. The on button it wouldn't do anything. So one thing led to another. I took it apart, and that's when I discovered that, of course, as expected with these things, the capacitors are leaking. So uh, it's a 486 SLC. Um, so it's not not that bad, but you can kind of see where the solder mask is starting to really cause a problem. So we've got to scrape all this crap away, you know, because the acid gets under here from the battery and all that. And then it's just, you know, just got to come off of there. So I've already cleaned this board once with... Um, a uh, toothbrush and all that, but yeah, the battery acid gets under there and causes havoc. So I got to go through there and check all of that. Um, same thing over here. Solder mask is bubbling up, going bad, and it's from the leaking capacitors. It's from the leaking capacitors. So 
The other thing too is there are three super caps in here. One of them's got a resistor on it and that one goes over here. So keep that in mind. Um, the other thing is, is the square pad indicates positive on the capacitors, even though the board's not marked, that's what they are. So, uh, don't forget that either because that's important, but yeah, I got to get all this solder mask off of here. It's just falling apart. I can go back in there with some nail polish or something and try to cover that stuff up if I want to protect it. But what it is, it's the acids and the electrolyte leaking out of the capacitors and the batteries getting under the solder mask. So they all have to come off. And that's ultimately what happened to this thing. So, yeah. I also removed this little inductor here, which is right there. I removed that so I can get underneath and see if there was anything under there. And I didn't see anything, but... Um, yeah, that's what we got right now with this with this board. So I've got to order some capacitors and the super caps. And, and, and here's another thing I want to talk about too is the price of these capacitors have risen astronomically over the last year. Well, pretty much like every other item that costs money now has gone off the radar as far as prices are concerned. And I don't want to get into the political discussion of why I think that is because... I just want to keep that to myself, but the point of it is, is we have these capacitors that we need to replace and they've gotten more expensive. So it's going to cost me about 48 bucks with shipping just to order the capacitors plus a few extras to do this job. So that doesn't include the film that I have to order to fix the LCD panel. Um, anyways, the other thing I got to do is figure out where these fell out because these fell out somewhere from within inside. Um, I, the service manual to this is available, so I can probably look up the service manual and figure out where those go. But for now, um, I think I'm going to end it. I did polish up the terminals. This one's got some really bad pitting, but I did polish up the terminals the best I could. It looks like it has mostly solid capacitors all the way around. Really, it didn't have the surface mount electrolytics like you see in half the other products out there, but the biggest, biggest things are those. And those are in the DC DC converter stages. So if we can't get clean DC going into the chips, it's not going to work. So I'm betting on that that's my problem. So at least that's what I'm thinking right now at this point. But for now, uh, we're going to just go ahead and get the parts ordered and I'll do the LCD later. The first things first though, is I need to get the caps ordered and make sure that this board will work. And if not, we can troubleshoot it and find out what happened to it. Um, for all I know, this could have been hooked up backwards and I forgot about it. And that's what blew it all up. It's really hard to say, but I don't see any evidence of that or signs of that. But I can troubleshoot it and figure out and make sure I get power coming out of the DC converters. But for now, um, that's where we're going to end things for this part of the video. And we will come back when we have all the parts in and we'll get all this put together and we'll do some testing. Um on that behalf. So the Omni books are a little different because they actually have a PC card, PCMCIA card for the ROM. This is the ROM that runs this machine. This has the BIOS and everything in it. It won't work without it. And the hard drive, same thing. The hard drive is also a PC card. So you would just, you'd have a physical hard drive in there or you can get a compact flash adapter, SD card adapter or anything like that now. And that's what it uses as its physical hard drive. There's two slots over here, and there's two slots over there. And one of the slots, D, is the slot that has the ROM. Um, the ROM that goes to this particular machine, there's the 425 and the 430, or 435. Um, this ROM has DOS built into the ROM and it always boots from ROM and you cannot change that which is great because then you can put a hard drive in it and this will initialize the drive and put its copy of Windows onto that hard drive because the compressed setup files are also in that ROM so it will set up the hard drive to what it needs but you cannot boot an alternative operating system with the 425 ROM you have to get the 430 and 435 ROM that is just a plain BIOS only 
to be able to boot from the hard drive. So that way you can actually put another copy of DOS, another version of DOS, Windows 95, Linux, whatever you want that's 486 compatible and be able to boot from that. The, the 430 ROM, 435 ROM. The 425 ROM will not. The 425 ROM mounts the DOS operating system or the disk operating system as the C drive while this drive is the D drive. There's no way, as far as I can tell, to change that. So just keep that in mind if you own a 425. You can't run a custom OS outside of what's already in ROM. You might be able to modify the chips on there, reflash it or something, but I don't know. I'm not getting into that. It's beyond the scope of this video. So cue a couple of weeks later, and of course the trip to the Vintage Computer Festival in the middle there. Um, so we're back at this again. And now we have our parts that we need to get this thing fixed, hopefully. I don't have the polarizing film yet for the LCD because I want to make sure I can get this board going before I start wasting money in that because otherwise there's no point. Um, also, just a little bit of a rant, and I'm sure people that work on this already know, the prices of capacitors have got, gotten astronomically expensive. There's caps in here that are over a dollar a piece now, and I remember them being about 60 cents. So, yeah, we're uh, things are getting ridiculous now. And it's starting to bother me a little bit. But it is what it is. I'm stuck with it. So, I scraped off the solder mask on the affected areas, and it appears that as time has gone on, there are things that are just kind of gotten a little bit worse. Yeah, so, huh, the solder mask is just rotting away. Probably not that critical. I might be able to just, you know, fill it in with some, like, nail polish or something. I don't know yet. I'll have to, I can actually probably get that material from eBay, the PCB stuff. But for now, let's just get this thing working and hope we can get this actually working. That would be ideal. So I have my replacement capacitors staged up and ready to go. I've got my super capacitors there. And one thing I want to make a note of before we start replacing this, I got my desoldering iron warming up, but uh, this super cap that was sitting right here has a resistor on it. So I don't know why they put a resistor on that, but they did. That means I'm going to have to work within those confines. So when I replace the one, I'm going to have to bend the lead up and solder that resistor on there when I get it all mounted in. Uh, the other two are fairly straightforward, luckily, so I'm, we're gonna do that here in a second. I'll probably pull that off and solder the resistor in first, then solder the battery, and then once they're held on, then, I don't know, we'll figure that out. All the new capacitors are in place. Got all three super caps in, and all three of the regular capacitors are in there. Um, at this point, I wanna apply some voltage to it keep in mind this uses negative uh terminal actually i can't do that yet i gotta put this transformer back in there that would certainly help anyways so i want to apply voltage to this and remember this center pin is actually negative it's center negative not center positive so as 12 volts i want to power it up and see if it idles uh you need the keyboard to physically turn it on but i want to see if it idles first and see if I have anything coming out of these power supplies and make sure everything's kosher. Obviously it's not gonna work without the ROM, but I don't need the ROM in there at this point in time just to see if chips get warm and everything idles. It wouldn't be a Tech Night video if things didn't go from simple to insane in less than a second now, would it? So, got the new capacitors in there, got everything in there and it's drawing current, however, nothing. The, the way these machines are supposed to work, there's an on off button here, but it's just a sleep button. So as soon as you connect power into these things and like hit the reset button on the back, uh, you should see it post. Well, unfortunately, it does not post. So I grabbed another ROM card because I have two ROM cards. This one will allow you to boot from the drive while this one has the OS built into ROM. So I tried two different ROM cards, nothing. So I put this away eight years ago and it worked fine probably longer than that and it worked perfectly now it doesn't uh i went through double triple quadruple check the traces i didn't see anything but the concern so now i've got this schematic 
pinout diagram of the 386SX, which is the same thing as the 486SLC chip. The only difference is the instruction set and whatever, but I don't care about that right now. The important thing is, is going through here and figuring out, okay, well, we've got a read-write line. So, you know, with the logic probe, I can probe the read-write line, and we literally have no bus activity. So I'm trying to do this single-handedly. Reset. Nothing. There's absolutely no bus activity from this CPU at all. And it gets warm. And I have all my voltages. I have my 3.3, my 5. I've got a negative 2.5 over there somewhere. Uh, or a 2.5 up here. I forget what it is. I have all my voltages. I'm just missing bus activity from yay. So now I printed out the data sheet and I'm trying to figure out, okay, which pins would stop the CPU from completing a bus cycle. And that's where I'm at at this point. Uh, I checked the reset line. It gets driven high and driven low when I press this button. So I know the reset circuitry works. Uh, this chipset here gets warm. This one is staying pretty cold. That has me concerned, but I'm not worried about that this second. I need to find out why the CPU cannot run. It's not being allowed to run, and I'm not sure why that is. There was a little bit of oxidation corrosion here. I checked the traces. It's good. I wonder if it wicked up inside the chip and actually killed the chip. Um, I don't have another one to drop in there, so I'd have to order one up and see what we have going on. But for now, I'm going to start going at it with the logic probe. And Oh, boy. All right. You know. So what I've found out thus far is... Doing some probing on my logic probe, the busy, when pressing the reset button in the back, the busy line will go from high to low. So busy gets held low, so the CPU is not going to do anything, anyways, if that's held low. Um, but even worse off, where is it? This line does not toggle, it stays low. And that's not an active low signal. So that means the processor is not seeing the reset pulse. So of course the CPU is not going to run because it doesn't see a reset pulse. I have no bus activity anywhere on the CPU. So, and it's getting hotter than shit too. So something's up. There's definitely something up here. Um, I'm probably going to measure the reset to ground and see if it's not shorted internally or something. Otherwise, I'm going to have to chase it back to figure out which one of these logic chips is responsible for controlling that reset line. Because something's up with that. I actually have the old CPU removed because I had my logic probe out and I was unable to get any activity from the CPU whatsoever. I was um, probing it with my logic probe. I got no activity on the data bus, the address bus, not even during a reset. And the busy line was going high and then low. Reset line was not toggling. Um, and it goes directly into this VLSI. And I'm hoping this VLSI is not bad because I can't get either of these from the Chinese electronic parts meat grinders out there um so if that's bad it's pretty much scrap at that point there's i might as well throw it away because there's no solution to that so on a hunch i went ahead and ordered up a new whole stock processor so we're going to install that guy in there and i hope that fixes it i really do we're going to find out because I, otherwise i'm not really i mean all of my voltages are there everything's there so we're going to give it a try and we're going to see what happens. I have the new CPU installed and there's a spot because there was a piece of foam there that was so old it was kind of rotten in place. But uh, CPU is installed now and at this point all I can do is hope that everything works. So we're going to get this installed. I don't have the screen or anything attached to it because I don't know, you know, I'm not sure you know, if it's going to work or not, but the best thing to do is just 
see if the hard drive spins up and if it posts or anything like that at this point I'm just going for broke all right that's installed this has not been formatted but it should still come up and spin up um that leaves this guy for power all right let's turn the power on Move that out of the way no current draw let's see do we get any current draw that's the next question I can't tell if it's working or not. Reboot. It's not drawing near as much power as it normally does. This thing was drawing like 0.15. So. Well, I guess let's plug a screen in and see if anything's actually happening. All right, screen's attached. It's just kind of barely hanging on there. Um, and as long as, if this works, then we'll do a separate video, but we gotta get the vinegar syndrome fixed because you can kind of see where it's starting to degrade and crack. And that's because this is made out of a PVA material. And anybody that works on old CRT televisions from the 60s knows, you know, PVA is not a good thing. So anyways, um, let's get this thing attached. It was drawing a lot less current. Uh, okay, no. Why am I getting... There we go. What do we have? Anything? Let's power the reset button. Drawing about the same amount of current. Maybe another higher. Uh, well... Not much going on. Dang it. Well. Yep, not much going on. It was worth a shot. Um, it was worth a shot. So, were we able to fix this? Nope, we were not able to fix it. That looks like it's going to be the end of the road for this guy, unfortunately. Um, the reset line is driven by the VLSI and goes straight into this chip. The reset line will not toggle, even though the busy toggles when I press this button in the rear. So this chip has to be defective. And um, I can't get them. The Chinese regurgitation parts houses do not have that chip in stock anywhere so unfortunately that's the end of the road for this guy so it's going to be parted out it's the only one i have so it's just sad and unfortunate but that's just what's happening now with these things so uh, i wish i had better news but i do not so some time has passed and to try to get to the bottom of this saga i got into a bidding war and picked up this machine and this machine was sold as non-working and and I and I didn't expect it to go for a whole lot because I didn't want to pay a whole lot for it because I needed I needed a machine that I could use as a reference to try to fix the other machine that has the motherboard issue so I picked this one up and it was as sold as is non-working and it could have the same problem and I you know anyways um that I just don't know. But what I will say is I decided to pick this guy up because I needed to take the chance anyways. And, I, and the working ones on eBay right now are an insane amount of money. And I'm like, well, the machines that this, this actually costs more than the machine that I'm trying to fix. Like almost twice as much. And... Yeah, I'm hoping that it's all good. So I want to do a quick inspection real quick because I want to I want, I want to try to get the board out and see what I'm dealing with. But before I do, I want to take a quick inspection and just see what we have. So 
Let's do that. All right, so what I've done so far is take out the cards. And this one here is the BIOS card. System slash applications. I don't know if it says Windows. I'm wondering if this is the same one that's in mine. But this goes on that side of the drive. And this card, for some reason, was over here. So it wasn't going to work anyways. But... Yeah, all right, so we have that one. Then we have the modem, which mine didn't even have, that goes over here on the side and it uses that other slot. So I want to take a quicker look at, or better look at that eventually. Then I have this card, which mine never had either. Communication. So there's a whole separate card here. Yeah, so this must be a ROM card that contains the drivers and software for that modem. And then, of course, we have the hard drive. And you should have seen this package. It was all smashed to bits. And actually, you can kind of see that over there. Yeah, that, that, that priority mail, that's how it came. So, yeah. Anyways, um, this is the drive that was in it. And it's probably no good anymore. There's a look at it. It's, well, never know, I guess. It's a 40 megabyte. So what this particular model is, is the Omnibook 300. It's not the 425 like I had, but it is a 300, and the keyboard feels okay. It's not as, it's rubber domey, of course. But the one thing I wanted to note is it does not have the LCD blistering that's going on here. Now, there there could be some issues here. i got to clean up. I don't know. The polarizing film, that looks like scratched. But anyways, this doesn't have the blistering on it like mine does. So already we're off to a good start. I could probably use this LCD panel. Um, does the mouse come out? Yep, mouse seems to come out. All that seems to be functional. But one thing I've noticed right away is... missing a bunch of stuff of course all the screws have been removed and they look kind of rusty so that's not instilling any good confidence in me but the battery box is not all damaged up or anything there's no corrosion on the terminal so there might actually be hope for this machine um the other thing i noticed is the door is actually still on here so i can actually get the door but all the screws are removed so someone clearly tried to take this thing apart once before so uh probably never completed it all the way because in order for them to come apart these have to be off it's the only way it'll work so uh plus the tabs missing the battery cover's gone all that stuff's gone so really this is a parts machine the other thing too is this is the 386 version where mine is the 486 which same pin out it's the SLC series, so SLC2, so um, it's it's technically a 386 with the 486 instruction set to begin with, but I need to see if I can't get this one apart because I want to check out the motherboard before I try to power it up because it's probably got leaking capacitors too, but I'm going to hope that the board is good in here. And there's two ways I can go about that. I can move the 486 processor over to this board and use this board, or... I can start inspecting the signals on this board and try to compare against what's going on with the other board. But I don't know. We'll uh, we'll have to play that one by ear. But let's get this apart. And when you want to take this apart, you should follow the service manual because it's it's painful. All right, these things are a pain to take apart. And what you got to do is where the PCM CIA cards go, you got to put a spudger tool in there, like uh, this tool right here. And then pop them loose, but you got to watch out because these doors and springs will fall out. Which is those guys right there. And then you lift that up, but you also have to take the screws out of the rear, which was already done. And then you have to hinge it this way, otherwise you'll tear these cables. So you hinge it this way, you pull this cable loose, and then you can hinge it all the way back. And then these, um, these pieces here will fall out on you but where they actually go is this one is one of them is labeled right it's not that one 
Let's see, this one's left. This one's right. So the way these actually work is these fall into this hole here and actually fall into this mechanism here. There's a there's a slide, there's a guide here. That goes in there and that goes there. So that allows the ejection to work for the PCMCIA. So this one goes over on this side here between there's another post between here and here. So that's where they go. They will fall out on you. So in case you don't know where they went, that's where they go. So we will uh, take those out and we'll look for it. But before we do, of course, uh, as predicted, the capacitors are leaking, spilling out their guts. And I'm doing a quick overlook on this board. It appears to have the same chipset. I don't know if it has the same oscillators yet, but it has the same chipset. But uh, there's no battery acid damage corrosion. But one thing I noticed right away is right here. There appears to be a hole blown into that semiconductor. So that's not giving me high confidence on this thing going to work properly. And I wonder if that's what happened to the other one. But I didn't see a hole blown on it. However, that doesn't necessarily mean it isn't bad. So that has me low-key worried. So I'm going to try that. I'm going to try this without that, and I want to see what happens. But I have an itching suspicion here that I'm hoping I didn't throw away even more money. But hey, that's just how it goes sometimes. Now, against the greater good and my own advice, I'm going to try to power this thing up anyways. So we're going to turn the power supply on, and then we're going to... I don't have the ROM cards or the hard drive cards or anything in there yet, so I'm just going to plug it in and see what happens draws less current make sure this thing's on the right draws less current than my other one does that's for sure let's see let's press the reset button back here yeah it's not really yeah the one thing I've noticed right away is it's drawing less current so is it actually powered on Yeah, I mean, that VLSI is starting to get a bit warm. So is this 386, which is an AMD, by the way. It's starting to get warm, so... Hmm, maybe it's safe to attempt to do this. So... Alright, how am I going to do this? I brought the other one out, too. This is the Omnibook 430, which is just a system card. I brought this to make sure that it's not bad, because the other one wouldn't boot this card at all, so... Let's try the original one first. All right, hold on. We need, let's see. I'm gonna put the hard drive in here. Get that slid in there first. Get, oh, I wanna mix these up, hold on. This is the one that came out of it. Let's get that in there first. Let's do that one. All right, let's see what happens now. Hey, it's pulling more current. Will it do anything? You should hear this spin up. Yeah, I don't hear anything. So this one might be dead too. Let's try a reset button. Whoa, that's weird. Whoa. Well, oh, I hear the hard drive spin. Holy crap. Oh, dang. So we got something. I don't know if you can hear it in the camera, but the hard drive spun. So, what if... Okay, okay, okay. So, the board's working. That's a good sign. That's a lot further than where we were before. Let's pull this one out. If I can get it out one-handed. <laughs> don't try this at home, folks. Uh, so, that one's going to come out. This is the original one. 
So I'm just going to leave that off the side. Uh, that's the one that came out of mine. So let's see if this card's any good. It may not be. That could be the whole problem. We gotta we gotta roll it out though. Is it executing code? Hmm. Well, let's hit the reset button again. Oh yeah, see that that's that's didn't do the other one. Does not do that. If you hear the hard drive spin, yeah, we do. It's very hard to hear, but the hard drive is running because it's pulling current. So, all right. That means my ROM card is good. So there's definitely something wrong with the other motherboard. And yeah, these caps are leaking, but they're not leaking enough to stop this thing from turning on. So, and the other one was in a similar state. So that makes me wonder if something actually failed on the other board. It had to have. And even with that being burned out like it is, um, it still runs. That's probably a power supply or something to this socket. So, um... It's possible that with the modem, it may not work. But, okay, so now we have something to go off of. All right. Now it's a decision, how further, how much further do I want to go? Do I want to just swap the board? But that's no fun. Or do I want to grab a, without the ROM card in it, for a controlled environment, do I want to grab my logic probe and start probing the pins and see what happens? See if it does the same thing the other one until I press reset. Because I remember, I don't know if I went over this in the, the previous installments because there's some time has elapsed, but I remember having my logic probe on the reset pin here, and this would not toggle. It would not toggle. Um, and it goes right to this VLSI. So what I want to do is I want to do the same test and see if it actually toggles on startup. And if it does, then we can confirm our suspicions that this VLSI is bad on the other board. All right, sure enough, I'm on pin eight, which is the reset line. It's low as expected. And if I tap the reset, if I can figure out how to do this with the camera, I gotta set the camera down so you can hear the tone. So press the reset back here. See that, hear it? Yeah, so, uh, goes to show you, this board toggles the reset line on the CPU. And I traced it on the other board, that reset line comes straight into the VLSI. So the VLSI went bad on the other board. So literally, the other board is a parts board. So I want to make this the correct board, so I'm going to pull this... Uh, 386 off of this board. Actually, I got to recap it. I'm going to move the caps over and all that stuff, but I want to pull the 386 off of this board and put the 486 chip on it. I also want to uh, check the um, clock crystals and all of that stuff. I want to compare the two boards and see if there's any differences. So I have the two boards side by side and I'm comparing the differences between the two. I got the old caps pulled out and I got the newer ones pulled out of this board. This is the dead board. Um, one thing I noticed right away is they're very similar. This one was made the 27th week of 93. This one was made the or 11th week of 93. So they're only made within a couple of months of each other, two, three months of each other. So they should be very similar, but there are some differences in the board design. One is right here. This board has a 50 megahertz oscillator here with... Um, a resistor right there. But this board, it's not populated. And then there's a jumper there, but I'm not sure what it goes to. I need to double check everything. So I'm going to pull all that off here um, and compare the two, but I'm wondering if the one of the other difference, key differences between the 486 and 386 is this. Maybe there's some extra DMA for the graphics where this one doesn't have it. I don't know. That's odd. But... 
this one has codes on here while this one does not it's just missing uh this one has got 31400 all these codes and they match up they're the same um, but these do not match up but they are the same part number 82c714 so fc1 fc1 so okay and then that's one difference the other difference is, is the placement of this bypass cap is slightly different different angle so then i go on to the other side of the board and i'm comparing the two other sides of the board just just out of curiosity and they're relatively the same but there are some differences for example on the dead board i patched a trace and it didn't work but there's a there's a trace that goes around between the super cap and then comes up to about here where there's a you know a transistor another transistor all that fun stuff go over to this board that circuit doesn't exist there is no transistor here there is no transistor here and there is no trace running in between the two points where the super cap is unlike here where that trace goes right to this other pad there which this one does not have it so yeah um interesting and this there was some corrosion over here but i checked all those traces and cleaned that up the best i can this one does not have that corrosion so yeah there are some differences these two chips are the same this oscillator is the same should be 14.3181 megahertz which it appears to be so that's the same there are some differences in the board so let's see that is h3b29 i don't know what that is probably the serial number yeah there's some differences there too but everything else looks to be the same so well actually no there are some differences there are two chips here three caps there one chip and missing the third cap well this one got relocated over here versus that one so there are some differences between the board designs i'm wondering if that's gonna matter oh yeah see there's a chip here some stuff missing on this board this is broke so i have to glue that huh there are some differences yeah it's still there too but there's just it's missing yeah there's some different these two circuits are connected together where they don't exist on this one that's interesting it's interesting to look at these boards side by side and detect all the differences in between revisions in just a few weeks time period so hmm makes me wonder when i swap the 486 board over the rom card probably identifies you know if it's going to be a 486 or 386 or whatever i don't know but um i'm just going to move the 486 chip over to try to match this board up to what it's supposed to be so i'm going to do that because that is the 386 that's the 486 so i'm going to swap these two out um hopefully that works and uh yeah i took the shield off of that by the way so i gotta clean up all the capacitor mess on that and there's some corrosion here where the cap is looked so that has me worried so i'll clean all that up the best i can uh because i don't want this chip going bad because then they're both fucked at that point so let's uh let's get moving forward on that hopefully i don't kill two boards in the process but got the cpu back off of that board and i'm got the oscillator components off of this board and i'm going to redo all that over here and we're going to move on from there got the oscillator stuff on there now um i got the bridge removed uh now i'm in the process of moving the cpu over and i tried to clear off some of that corrosion with reflow and flux but i got to really get it all cleaned up and then i got to clean all the capacitor goo up the CPU has been reinstalled. The old one's over here. I'll probably put it in my stash just to have it. But uh, new CPU's in place. I'm just, it's very hot, so I'm just waiting for it to cool down. And then um, at that point, it's scrubbing up the flux and all this capacitor gunk and then putting it back together. And then we're going to test it. 
Let's hope I didn't break anything. All right. The uh, processor's back on. All the cap goo is cleaned up. I didn't put the super caps back in yet, but I don't think that's going to be necessary for testing. Maybe. Anyway, so that's all in there. Now it's just a matter of seeing if everything works. I have not fired this up yet, so I want to see if it'll boot. I'm going to get the system card put back in here. Oops. Yeah, that was smart. The system card put back in here like so. Yeah, I still got to fix that one little piece that's broke. System card's in there. Now I got to put the hard drive in here. Because I want to hear if it fires up or not. Okay, power on. Move it out of the way so we can see current draw. Alright, so here we go. Reset. Hmm. Do we get anything? Well, I really hope I didn't kill this thing. <laughs> oh yeah, I still gotta change that. All right, well. No activity. Well, that's a shame. Let me uh, plug a screen in so I can figure out what's going on. All right, so I went through this again. I grabbed my logic probe, and the 486 chip is trying to do something, but it's dying somewhere in the post process. So I'm wondering if they're, because the original board has a tag here, like some codes here, but this board doesn't. And I'm wondering if there's a difference that won't allow a 486 to actually run in this board. I'm not entirely certain why that would be the case because the board design is very similar, but there's clearly a difference somewhere. So I'm gonna swap the 386 back in here and make sure that the thing works and that I didn't screw something up. Uh, Cause I changed caps and I did all that stuff. I'm gonna, there's also a metal pad under here and I'm wondering if it's shorting out to a via below um, where that one does not have a metal pad. So. I'm gonna put the chip back in there and try again. So the Omnibook saga continues. So the second one that I got, I swapped the CPU out, just as you've seen earlier, and it's dead now. Nothing I do can bring it back. I put the original CPU back on it. No activity on the bus, just like the first one. So I put the 486 chip back on there, on it, and I got bus activity, but it doesn't post. So I'm like, oh my God, here we go. So glutton for punishment, I picked up a second one. So that now makes three of them. So I'm hoping this one works and I don't have to um, screw around with, you know, changing out CPUs and stuff like that. I'm just going to leave it well enough alone and I'm not going to try that this time. So one thing I'm going to notice, though, is on this one I picked up, it's a little different. And I'm trying to discern why it's different, but I'm not sure. One thing, we're missing a label. And you would think, oh, well, maybe it just fell off. Well, I would think that, too, except for the fact, well, there's damage on the LCD, but there's no sticker here. Even more so, there is no stickers on the bottom, except for these two. And there's no terminals for the AA batteries. It's just this specific battery pack. That's it. Also, there's no ROM cards in here. There's, a, there's supposed to be a... There's no label here. There's, there's a D. There's supposed to be a C and a D and an A and a B over here. Oh, oh there's C. C's right here. But there's no D. And there's no ROM card in there. Just like the other one. It takes a ROM card that sits there. Also, 
there's the eject mechanism on that side, but guess what? It's not there on this side. The mouse is broken out of there, but it's missing the eject lever there. So, I wonder if this thing is a prototype or a development model. So there's no there's no ROM card, so I figured, you know, this thing's not gonna work. So without the ROM card, it's not gonna do much of anything, but we'll turn the power on here and we'll plug it in. As soon as I get the thing in the hole. There we go. Sure enough, it fires up. See, 1994, version 3.0.1, 486SX at 33 megahertz. So, this is a prototype power book, or not a power book, Omnibook 425 or a 430. Since it wants a system disc, it must be a 430. That's incredible. So, this is not an Omnibook 300. This, okay. Now I got my saving grace. I can take the other two units that are crap, they're junk now, and I can move the capacitors and all that stuff over and maybe build this one up and make this one nice and clean and have a prototype. I don't know, we'll see. We'll have to see how that works. So I took it apart and this design is completely different. It uses this different set of VLSIs, and the CPU is over here instead of over here. And it's a larger CPU, so this thing is entirely different design, and there's two caps instead of three, like the other one has. So this thing is incredibly different. It's actually quite amazing to me. So, yeah, this one does not have the slide on it. You can see where it would have gone between here and here, and a spring would have been there, like there. But it does not have it. That is actually pretty amazing to me. The mouse is completely gone. It's been busted off, so I'm going to have to replace it. But, yeah, this, uh, this thing is a, is, a, is, is a completely different design. I wonder if this is the Omnibook 530. It very well could be, but it's a completely different design, which is fascinating to me. Which means I can't use it to fix the other ones. So I have to fix this one, and, and, or something like that. Also, it does not have the double A section either, and the circuitry for it doesn't exist. So, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting observation. I actually got the motherboard out so we can take a closer look at it. The mouse has been damaged. I'm going to have to replace it. Probably take one off the other unit. But, uh, yeah, we have our full-size 32-bit 486 in here, unlike the other models. But, um, also, the back side. There's the ROM. It looks like the PCM-CIA socket has been replaced once before, because it's different than the rest of them, but it's got, you know, flux on it from soldering. The memory cart is different, so I don't know what memory this takes, as far as expansion's concerned. But... There's a lot of bodges on here, too. There's one there, there, one over here. I'm not entirely certain what chip that is. There's that proprietary connector thing that was not present on the other models. And it does not have the fingers for the battery, which I may have mentioned already. Uh, other than that, yeah, it's a completely different system. Completely different. So, I'm just curious what model this actually is it's a mystery this one's got me intrigued because i don't know what this is i don't know if this is the omnibook 530 which it might be but i don't know um it's something i gotta figure out yeah hmm. so it's got two capacitors in here instead of the three like it normally does they're 820 at 25 volts so yeah, they're just now starting to leak. You can kind of see the green crusties um, on that lead there. This one, not quite yet, but 
yeah, I'm going to change them before they get bad because, yeah, I don't want to go through the, what I went through. So I have three of these machines now, two of which don't work, and I bought this one to fix one of the other ones, but uh, I'm going to leave it alone because this is a unit that I've not seen before, and it's the top of the line one compared to all of them. So I'm probably going to take, because you saw the LCD, there's some damage on the LCD, so... I'm probably going to take the LCD panel off of the other unit that I killed and move it over and then leave everything else alone. Um, possibly rebuild this battery pack um, if I can get it apart. There's a, some crusty crap in there and it's gone. It's an HP F1045A rechargeable nickel metal hydride. Um, it doesn't take the double A's, unfortunately, like the other one does. That's what was unique about it, but this one's not gonna, it's just not. So, yeah, uh, because the ROM is now on the board, it frees up this fourth slot. So I have all four PC card slots to use, with the exception of, I gotta have a hard drive in one of these. But I also have to set up the hard drive, since this does not have the application memory. Um... Yeah, I got to think about how I want to do that because since this machine does not boot from PCMCIA on this one, I can't create a factory. Huh, I got to think about that because I can't boot the other systems up anymore to create a factory hard drive that has Microsoft Windows and all that stuff on it that has the HP drivers and everything. I don't have that on this one, so yeah, I gotta think about that for a minute. Anyways, I think the next thing I need to do is just recap it and start taking them all and making the best one out of the three at this point. That's where we're at with it right now. But it's currently the weekday and just a quick little shooting a little clip after work. So I probably won't get to this until the weekend. For you, you'll see it in like two seconds, but for me, it'll be a week. I have since figured out that this is the Omnibook 530, um, which is very similar to the 600 series, the 600 being color. Uh, these, for some reason, are stupid expensive on eBay, and but the eBay tax is ridiculous in my mind right now for all of it, in my opinion, but I don't want to get into that in this video. But... Since this is the best one out of the bunch, and this is the only one that works right now out of the bunch, somehow I ended up killing two motherboards. This has been a disaster from the beginning, but anyways, this is the one we're going to work on. Um, I might be able to get one of the other ones working, but I know I'm going to get this one working. Now, whether this is a prototype or not, it's who knows? Who, who really knows? Someone peeled off the stickers and put something on there or the stickers were already gone from the factory it's really hard to tell i don't know don't really care but what i do want to do is actually get this thing working so i've got the 425 that died on me and then the 300 i bought to try to fix the 425 and somehow i managed to kill the 300 too but this one has a few things that are missing that we need to get going for one thing the mouse the original mouse looks like it's been ripped out so we have to replace that but also, this one is uh, missing some RAM, so I've got to get some RAM for it, and they're stupid expensive right now as well. But uh, also, it needs caps, but the caps are slightly different than what's in the other ones. Um, I only have the replacement super caps on hand, just these three, I don't, because they're expensive, and I didn't order any extra, so I have those three. They've already been in other two boards, so I had to pull them out. We're going to put them in this one. And then I want to change these two, which are 820 microfarad at 25 volt. Uh, I have the 1500 spares that I use for the other ones, which I'm probably not going to use. But I do have these thousands at 25 volt. Um, so, yeah, I'll probably use those. See how they work. Now, something just occurred to me. These may have been low ESR capacitors. And when I took the original ones off the other boards and recapped it, I've noticed both of those boards, when I recapped them and tried to reflow and all that stuff, it didn't work. It didn't work. Neither board worked. But, uh, 
this board does work for now and so did the 300 board until i recapped it and tried to change the chip and all that and then it quit working um and i couldn't bring it back there is bus activity on the 486 cpu but not the 386 cpu so i think i killed the 386 cpu with heat maybe a little too much heat maybe there was moisture trapped inside the chip it's hard to say but it didn't work but the 486 chip will try to work but it doesn't the board won't run at all and i'm wondering did i did i actually buy the low esr caps did I buy the low ESR? I don't know. Did I? Well, that's a good question. And I don't know if that makes a difference in this board. I bet it does because they're DC-DC converters. Um, anyways, this board works. I don't want to touch it. I really don't want to touch it. I don't want to touch these chips. I don't want to screw this up for a third time because it's getting expensive. Um, but these caps are leaking and they have to change. They have to be changed. So... We're going to try this a third time. We're going to go ahead and replace these capacitors. And, uh, yeah, let's hope it fires up. Once we do that, then we're going to clean up this case a little bit. And then we're going to try to change the mouse. And I'm going to, I got a box of crap somewhere, um, uh, from the 300 series. Because the 300 is never going to work again. Because, if you remember, the screen is damaged on this one. So I have to replace the screen. I'm going to use the one from the 300. And I'm going to use the mouse from the 300 to get this thing fully functional too. So we're going to do all that. And then hopefully we can get this thing back online. But I do not have the original factory OS for this. Because, if you remember, this contains the BIOS. Unlike the older ones where everything was on a card. So... The BIOS requires the drive to have the operating system and everything on it. So I do not have the HP Windows 3.1 or all of that for this computer. And also I don't have the stickers for this too. So it's yet to be determined if I leave the stickers off of it or if I put it on or I don't know yet. But I do want to get this machine fixed. And I do want to use some of the parts I had on the 300 to get this machine complete. So at least this will be good and it'll I'll have a functional omnibook at that point finally and I'll move it off to the side and that'll leave the 425 and the 300 the remaining parts I could possibly mix and match and maybe get that working again because I will eat my hat if I wore hats if the, these caps aren't low ESR and that's been my problem the whole time oh that'd be such a rookie mistake and I've been doing this stuff for almost 20 years oh man Okay, so we'll, we'll, we're going <laughs> to, yeah, we'll be back in a minute. All right, so I got the new capacitors installed. I got the board cleaned up with Q-tips and alcohol, but I got new caps installed. I got the new super caps installed. Um, I did not have the exact, I have the, these were originally 820s at 25. I only have thousands, which for this application, in theory, should be good. But, you know. Anyways, let's find out if this thing actually works. I guess we're gonna figure that out here shortly. Let's turn the voltage up to 12. I'm gonna leave it there. I'll just leave it on. Okay, the bit. So what we're gonna do is try to do this single-handedly because I have not fired this up yet. So we're going to do that here now. I didn't put a screen on it yet, but we are going to try to fire it up. See if I have any activity at all from the bus again. Reset button. Do I have any signs of life at all? I have no idea. i got to plug a screen in. So, what we're going to do is I'm going to move you out of the way, unturn power off, and we're going to plug the screen in, which is going to be hard to do. Okay. Yeah, this is going to be, all right, well, let's do this. Let's move you, let's do it like we've done every other time here. You can see the screen's damaged, so... I can't use it. Oh, 
All right. Now, do we have any signs of life at all? Yes, we do. Okay, good. I didn't kill the board. Thank God. Oh, some clock errors and stuff. 241, 280. Invalid configuration. Yeah, I'd say so because it's got to recharge those. Okay, so. Thank God. That board works. I'm still curious if the other board works. I wonder if I put... Well, no, I threw the original caps away. Damn it. I was going to say, I wonder if... I halfway wonder if I put the original caps back in the other board, if it comes back alive. Yeah, I'd, I'd somehow I have an itching suspicion that I highly doubt it. But. But. Huh. All right, well, let's move on to the next thing. Let's, uh unpack the junk out of the uh, rest of the Omni books. I threw them all in a box and put them up when I got frustrated until this one came in. Uh, I need to get this done on that particular machine next before I put this motherboard back in there. Alrighty, I got the mouse parts back in connected. I got the motherboard back in. So this is now solid again. Uh, the mouse, I added a little drop of super glue and I got a weight sitting on it because the the, the adhesive has come loose on this carbon track thing and you can see where it's been crinkling up a lot in the use so I've got a little dab of glue there at the end to try to hold this thing and stop this thing from coming apart um, I don't know how well it's going to work it's been through heck and, um, so when I go to put it in it should just snap into place um, it should so then when I get the mouse sl slid in I can take the button and just pop it right in so that's done and that's out of the way uh you know the next thing i need to do is see if the screen from the omnibook 300 will actually work on this board because it's got a different chip as far as i can tell uh i think it does yeah it's entirely well it's not entirely different let's see this is a chips 65535 and this is a chips 65 Five one zero. It's different, so I don't know if the screen is gonna work. God, I hope it does. Oh, that would suck if the screen's not compatible because then I don't have any way to to work it. So yeah, let's let's make sure the screen's compatible. All right, I took the screen off the keyboard assembly to make it easier to work with. Uh, this one's got bad polarizing film. You can kind of see it, and it's got uh, vinegar syndrome developing. You can see the lines in it. Um, so I know that needs new film, but this is the one that's off my 425 Originally, so we're gonna go ahead and plug this in Let's see if it actually works. Ah, come on Oh, I got some activity. Oh, there we go. That's working So it does work with that screen Let's see. Oh, you know what? Hold on. I see a problem right now. Let's adjust this. Turn it up. Yeah, dad. Dang it. It's got a line in it. So, that's going to be a problem. I wonder if that's a bad uh, connection in the panel. Maybe. I don't know. It's hard to tell. It could be leaking capacitors, too, because I don't know what the screen looks like in here. I guess we're going to find out, though. Uh, but, yeah, it's got a line in it. It's not that big of a deal, but... It does work at least, so there's that. At least we know that. It's all good. That screen's good, even though it's got a line in it. Alright. Unplug you. Alrighty then, so... I know that screen works. So now I can take the 300 screen and move it over. Well, I gotta check the plastics and see how well they are because if the plastics are all beat up, I'm gonna take and switch the screens around inside the bezel. So here's the awesomeness about this. I finally got the display bezel off. Well, come to find out, it's actually glued together or ultrasonically welded. So this display is not supposed to come apart. Uh, yeah, so I had to break it all free, which means if I have to, when I put this thing back together, I actually have to glue it back together. Oh, man. So, 
This is the one that has the vinegar syndrome. I tore it apart because, well, the panel needs the thing replaced. But uh, I also, this pl these plastics are in a lot better shape. This is my 425. So since these plastics are in better shape, I'm going to use that one instead. Um, here's the original. Uh, it's damaged, as you can tell. So, And the original is actually not in bad shape either, but there's glue and stuff all over it that won't come off. So it has to go. It's got to be replaced. So I'm going to take the screen. It's going to take juggling all three because i got to take the screen out of the 300, which is all scratched up and dinged up and scarred. And then put it into these plastics and then put this assembly onto that keyboard housing. Yeah, alright, well, let's get to it. So, the display, you, you'll have to take the display and do this with it so it looks like this. That way we can get these two cables out without ripping them. But you also have to unsolder that ground lug there as well as the one over here hidden behind these cables. So you have to be very careful. And other news, well actually the good news about this is, there's no electrolytic capacitors on here that you need to worry about. So if your screen assembly is still good, you don't need to take it apart for any reason. So everything in here is good. The other good news is, remember the line I had in the display that kind of came and went? Well, it has discrete chips here, so I could figure out which chip is responsible for it and replace it if it were bad. So luckily, you know, I can still do that with this. And then there's the part number of the display if anyone's interested. I want to show you how serious battery acid and electro or acid migration actually is. So this resistor fell apart when I took it apart the first time around. And this is on the side, yeah, this is on the side where the battery is. Well, look what happened. The battery acid corrosion had wicked up the cable. You can see the green crusties there. But not only that, after it wicked up the cable, it started to attack the copper and stuff on this PCB. So um, I'm going to have to clean that up. And that might be why um, <clears throat> there's a line in the screen that comes and goes. But not just that. That's also probably why there's vinegar syndrome. Because the battery acid fumes started to attack the PVA material. So it's all starting to make sense now. Um, and that's probably what killed the motherboard. Even though... The batteries were out of the unit, but the acid's still in there and it was just eating away at the board because I didn't clean it up, you know, 12, 10 years ago, whenever it was, 8 years ago. Because it worked in, but it doesn't now. And I think it's because similar things happen to a chip. Epoxy seals aren't perfect. So the acid can wick its way up these pins and into the chip and kill the chip. And I'm thinking that's what happened to that one. It got in the board and into the chip and killed things. So... Anyways, I'm going to clean up the back cover. I got the back cover completely off now. Um, so I'm going to, this was the 425. So I'm going to clean up this cover. And I want to move the 300 screen in there and glue it back together. And then I'm going to put that assembly onto that base. And we're going to put the 530 back together. And uh, that's going to be my main unit. And if I can get the 425 working again with all these other parts, including this screen, I will. If not, it's no big loss. At least I have the 530. So the next crazy, insane thing I got to do is glue this thing back together. So I had to go get some glue and a pile of clamps and a block of wood. And we're going to mix this stuff up and hopefully get it together. Yeah, this is going to be the ugliest repair in the century folks this epoxy dries way too fast uh on top of that the wood that i tried to use there this was getting in the way so when i tried to clamp it it was making the plastic do this so i couldn't uh it's not ideal but i had to do it this way what i what i needed to do was cut a groove in that wood for this thing so unfortunately it's gonna be the ugliest thing in the world i mean it's not perfect i've done the best i possibly could there's going to be high spots and low spots you know there's some crap in there that's not going to come out because the epoxy is already hard i can't yeah it says up on it says on the thing oh you got 30 minutes to work with this stuff uh yeah bullshit it was hard in three uh anyways so yeah it's not perfect you can see some in there yeah, I couldn't get it clamped hard enough, fast enough. So, unfortunately, 
Not much I can do about it. Oh, oh well. Well, now that the epoxy has set up and hardened, um, it's all together now. It's not going anywhere, but uh, obviously it's not perfect. You can kind of see where clamp got here, but I needed another couple more. So, and then it's a little bit messy over here. It's yeah, it's not perfect. Once I figured out the screen was glued, I mean, there's just so much you can do. But otherwise, it's it's intact. It's not going anywhere. So I think we're good. It'll it'll hold it together. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this thing all put back together now in the reverse order that I took it apart, and we'll be back. All right, it's all back together now. Um, I don't think I, I can clean the top cover a little bit, but I don't think it came out too bad. Um, I do want to go over these little flapper things. These are a pain to get back in here, and there's one on the other side. Um, and the way you got to do it is when this thing is still apart and this is upside down, you have to get there's grooves in here. You have to carefully get your fingers and get the pliers and all that fun stuff and actually slide it down onto the bottom cover. So when this thing is like this, the flappers hang down from the top. So there are three grooves in there that the flapper will actually sit into. So you've got to get the spring on it and then set it in the groove. And the, the actual spring will just kind of be like sticking up like this. Uh, and it'll be in there. But if you flip it over, it's going to fall out. So just careful. Get it in there on both sides. And then when you do that, you got you got the keyboard ribbon that's got to be plugged in. You can do you can usually do that first, so this thing is tilted up, um, and then carefully get those in there, and then get the top back on here front first, so things can't fall out, and then get your LCD cable plugged in, and then sandwich it all together. So now it's all back together, um, and the flappers are in there. This one originally didn't have a flapper on this side. And I just put it in anyways. Uh, and the reason why is because the hard drive is got a tall, you know. Anyways, so I just got to put these screws back in now. Everything is together. So it didn't, I mean, you could still see the epoxy a little bit in there. But it didn't come out too bad, I don't think. I mean, it could have been a lot worse. So it's together. Now... I can actually plug this thing in and hope that it works. And it should. Because it worked before. Yeah, we're good. The only thing I do not have for this is the actual factory restore media. I do not have the original Omnibook drivers or any of that. I, I've still got a copy, uh, and that's why I pulled this out because. The one when it used to work, I actually formatted this drive with the other Omnibook. And this has a bunch of this stuff on it. And the ROM card that would have been in here with this one doesn't have, I copied all that stuff off the D drive from ROM and the C drive. I think that, I forget which one it was. One of these is the C, one of them is the D on the original Omnibooks. I copied both. They're both on here. So I have that stuff, but I don't know if they're the same. Um, and I can't find the restore media on this thing anywhere. Anyways, so the next thing we need to look at is how do we get a system on this on this um, computer? Because I don't have the floppy drive or any of that that goes to this. So trying to get an MS-DOS bootable OS on a PCM CIA card is fun. Uh, there's a way to do it. It's a pain in the ass. And that, I might dedicate that for a separate video. Um, because the original drive that this thing had was this one here. Actually, this was in the other one. And this one's dead. It doesn't work anymore. And I had another one of these at one time, and it doesn't work either. So that must must be a common problem with these. So this does not work anymore. But I do have this one. And this one actually does work. So basically, what you got to do is... it's Unless... Unless you have an SD card, the CF card adapter, or uh, or one of these that takes an SD card instead, which you can just use a modern system, but uh, this is PCM CIA, but at least it's compact flash, so I can put it in a compact flash USB adapter. Um, the other problem is, 
This has to be formatted to be MS-DOS bootable and compatible, which is not easy to do on a modern system. Um, you can use an older system to format it, but the problem is F-Disk does not run inside Windows 98. At least I can't get it to work properly. And you can't just stick this in an older but newer laptop to do it because it won't, you won't, the DOS won't detect this unless you have the Cardsoft drivers loaded with the DOS boot disk in order to see this from DOS. Um, and it's going to, yeah, anyway, it's a pain. So what I ended up doing is I set up DOS box and I set up uh, a hard disk image. And the way I set up a hard disk image is I read this drive as it is. And I saved it on the computer and mounted it in DOSBox X. And it actually allowed me to see that image as a physical drive. And I could I could boot up DOSBox with an MS-DOS floppy image and format that particular drive. So, it's not going to see that until I reboot it. And then, uh, yeah. Ooh. So, I formatted this with... Uh, DOS box and then I, I did a format slash s so it copied the system files on that drive so as you can tell we've got a functional Microsoft DOS operating system now here's another point I need to bring up this BIOS does not support drives bigger than the 504 megabyte limit unless you use drive overlay software but since this is a PCM CIA drive I don't know if it's going to do that, but once DOSBox was set up, I partitioned it 500 megs and then all of that fun stuff and formatted it, did the system file copy. And then what I did was once DOSBox was done, I used DD and I imaged or took the hard disk image and wrote it back to this physical drive and it, it works. So that method does work. There's probably better methods, easier methods, but that's the method that I used. Um, if anyone wants more detail on how to do that, I could probably do a video on it, but that's just the summary. So it's functional now. This computer's functional. Uh, I also, like I said, I have copies of the older Omnibook stuff. I can probably put back on this drive and do something with it, but yeah. Anyways, I think that's going to be it. I'm going to call it for this video. This video, it's, it's functional. Uh, what I want to do is possibly order another cpu and see if i can't get the 425 working oh that reminds me before i wrap this video up there's something i want to see and i don't know if it's going to work or not but there's something i want to check and that is this this is the floppy drive out of my omnibook 5700 and it has a pull out cable so i wonder i absolutely wonder if maybe that this drive will actually work with this Omnibook. I don't know. I'm curious if the BIOS has a driver for these types of floppy drives. Because how did this thing have a floppy drive originally? I don't know. I've never, I've never uh, run into this again. It's just yeah, it's painful. So I want to see if it actually works with DOS. I'm gonna get my plug in here. All right. I'm curious if it'll detect that drive. Oh, error 543. I wonder what that means. Probably not. It probably wants a very specific version of that drive. Hey, you know what? I saw a parallel cable. I wanted to see if it would work. Nope. It does not work. Fail. Fail. Anyways, so yeah, it doesn't work. But I figured I'd try. Anyways, that's gonna be it until I get to the other Omni book, which I might do that branch that off into its own final video. But for now, I think I'm gonna end it here with this one. Um yeah, that didn't work, unfortunately. I was hoping it would. <laughs> I couldn't get so lucky, right? Uh, all right, so I want to get this in here. This went to the other Omnibook as well because I see these missing so often. I still got to put the uh, screw.
screws in here. Ah, oh, there we go. Will it close? Yeah, it closes. Will it stay closed? That's the next question. Uh, okay, so screws in here. Another screws in here. I got a nice tool for doing those screws right here. It's an old Sonnet Technologies accelerator tool, which fits these lugs perfectly. Like so. All right, I wanna move the, oh, that got bent. Yeah, oh well, not perfect. This whole thing has been in the epitome of not perfect. But that's fine. It's vintage. It's got battle scars. Why are you not screwing down? Well, that's nice. There we go. Must have been stripped. You can tell that was used a lot. All right, so that's that. It's in there now. I don't think it's going to hold. I might have to put a magnet or something in there. But yeah, it's it's good. So that's it. That's it for this video. Um, thank you for watching. Feel free to leave a comment if you have one. And you know what to do. You can like the video if you like it or dislike it. But if you do dislike it, please give me some feedback on why so I can try to improve. Otherwise, it's going to be the same thing over again. And then join the Discord below if you wish to have some fun discussions. So thank you for watching. And until next time.